Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 20th session of the IEC CAFRED seminar series. Today's seminar will be held in English. Our speaker of the day is Sheikh Mohammed Suleiman Al Harthi from the Sultanate of Oman, who is Executive Vice President of Strategic Development Sector at BEA, the Oman Environmental Services Holding Company, and who will be introduced in more detail by our moderator. Mr. Al Harthi will be speaking to us about waste management in Oman towards a circular economy. Today's session will be moderated by Mrs. Maya Chiara Rossi from Italy, whom I will briefly introduce. Mrs. Rossi is a sustainability professional with extensive technical expertise, as well as a scientific and economic background. Her focus is on climate change and climate finance, in which she has substantial experience. Throughout her career, Mrs. Rossi has worked across the five continents with various governments, as well as with numerous companies from a variety of sectors, including government agencies, intergovernmental organizations, mining, oil and gas, as well as construction, financial services, development institutions, and the International Finance Corporation, or IFC Bank, whose parent organization is the World Bank. Lately, she has been focusing on climate finance, climate sustainability strategies, stakeholder and public engagement processes, UN SDGs, innovation labs, and climate change adaptation, as well as mitigation projects. In parallel to her extensive professional engagements, she is currently pursuing her PhD at the School of Management of the University of Bath in the UK, in the context of which she is studying the intersection between the effect of climate change on organizations and careers, with a focus on risks and opportunities of the net zero transition economy. I will now highlight some housekeeping for our audience. Everyone except the speaker will be muted by default during the session to avoid disruptions. You can choose to have your personal camera on or off. It would be appreciated if you could display your own name. The talk will last roughly 30 minutes, after which there will be a moderated Q&A session. At this point, you can ask questions or make comments either by writing in the chat or by raising your hand. The session will be recorded and will be published on the IAC CAFRAD Seminar Series YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And now I will pass the word to today's moderator. Thank you, Yelena. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 20th session of the EAC CAFRAD Seminar Series. So I will be your moderator today and I'm thrilled to be joined by Mr. Mohammed Sheikh Mohammed Sulaiman Al Harti from the Sultanate of Oman, who will be speaking to us on the topic of waste management in Oman towards a circular economy. So, um, Sheikh Mohammed is especially well positioned to address us on this topic as he is the Executive Vice President of Strategic Development Sector at BIA. Oman Holdings Company for Environmental Services. BIHA is an Omani closed stock company fully owned by the government, which implements government policies and strategies in all areas of the waste sector. Since its establishment in 2007, the company has taken great strides in providing state-of-the-art waste management services in Oman and has successfully transformed the sector. So we are here to today to hear more about it. The period between 2012 and 2020 especially has seen a focus on infrastructure development and operation commencement. So the next phase will focus on a transition to a sustainability operating model that harness the power of circular economy by embracing the opportunities it presents, both in terms of investments as well as job creation. So today's presentation, we look at some of the main waste streams and their associated challenges in the context of BIHA broader waste diversion strategy. So to further introduce our speaker, I will give you some highlights because the CV is definitely too long of his bio. As previously mentioned, 
Shehik Mohammed is the Executive Vice President of Strategic Development at Oman Environmental Services. In this role, he is responsible for setting out Bihar's strategic direction, enhances corporate performance, maintaining and improving public relations, and developing a sustainable, a sustainable business model for the different waste streams. He holds an MBA with a concentration in marketing and entrepreneurship, a master's degree in computer engineering, and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Prior to joining Biha, Sheikh Mohammed held several leading roles in different organizations, including Shell, Oman Marketing, and Omania e-commerce. So I hope I captured the spirit of your curriculum, Sheikh Mohammed. So I've been um, in this sector for nearly 20 years, so before it was cool. And I really believe that the circular economy is the future because one thing we know about this planet is that resources are limited and we need to find a way to make waste, not waste anymore, but to make them resource. So today I'm thrilled to be here and the floor is ours, please. I will see you very briefly. I will see you at the end. So now we have the presentation. I will see you at the end, let's say in 30, 40 minutes. And we can have a QA session and you will be invited if you have more questions for Sheikh Mohammed or if you want to have a chat about circular economy in general, we will be very happy to hear your thoughts. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Maya. Um... Thank you, Sheikh Ahmad and Jelena, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, good morning to the to colleagues who are joining us from uh, the Americas, from the Bahamas, I believe. Uh, we have some colleagues, so good afternoon in Europe and good evening even to India. Uh, today's presentation is going to take you through our, our um, uh, transition in Oman from uh, the conventional uh, waste management towards what we want to be in terms of circular economy. You'll have to excuse me if I go into little details because I assume that not everybody comes from this background. So you might want to understand what I'm talking about, but I'll try to be brief. Maybe in 30, 40 minutes, uh, I'll be done with this presentation. I'll go very quickly. Okay, starting with the, let me see. Okay, let's start by, defining waste what are what is waste because we get lots of confusion when we talk about waste and people do not understand that we deal with waste differently uh, you can you can uh, look into waste as uh, from the source that's coming from so for example we have what we call municipal waste municipal waste basically is everything that we get out of our households everything that we get out of homes and anything that is of uh, similar nature, so it comes from commercial entities, from institutions and others, this is all municipal waste. Basically, when you see a truck, a garbage truck outside on the road uh, transporting waste, that would be municipal waste. Everything else is non-municipal waste, and usually it is of industrial nature, agricultural, healthcare, or other waste, other waste streams, what we call waste streams. So it's important to understand this because I'm going to share some figures, I'm going to share some approaches how do we deal with the different kinds of waste other waste usually we call them waste streams in, uh, in BIA here waste streams basically we have almost 14 15 waste streams these are examples we have end of life vehicles for example electronic and electro electrical waste we call waste electrical and electronic equipment uh, lead acid batteries end of life tires construction and demolition waste and many others and I'll go through them very briefly throughout the presentation so let's see what was the situation in Oman prior to 2012. Probably so many uh, would share this situation. I think they, they will be, you will relate to this situation. If you come to Oman, many visitors to Oman will tell you that Oman is very clean, very beautiful and very clean, especially the cities. But we used to have a problem when it comes to the back office. And I'm gonna share with you some images. This video will tell you of the situation that was here before 2012. These are what we call um, traditional dump sites, over 300 of them scattered across Oman. And you see a mix of different kinds of waste going in there. End of life tires. You have sewage down there, you can see sewage. You have animals walking in because these are uncontrolled. So animals would go in and feed from waste. As a result, you have dead animals there. 
naturally we had fires, pollution out of these dump sites. Has this waste, this is healthcare waste, you see dumped in, uh, in normal dump sites. This is hazardous waste, paints and others, sewage. Everything was mixed, even expired products that sometimes ended up going back on the shelf. And this was our recycling industry. That's the informal, you have scavengers going into the landfills or dump sites, collecting whatever they can collect. You see, this is how they treat lead acid batteries, for example. These are end, life, end of life vehicles, electronic and electrical equipment, and so on. This was a situation prior to 2012. I see something on my screen. I think somebody put some, let me just see. Sorry, let me just exit out of this. Do you guys see these green lines? Yes, but we can still uh, read the slide, so don't yeah, worry. Somebody added lines there, sorry. Okay. Anyhow, as a result of this, the government uh, conducted a study back in 2006 to see how to fix the situation. And as a result, the company that I represent was established in 2007. So if you see recommendation number two was to establish a holding company owned by the government to control waste as, uh, as a whole for Oman. So BIA basically is in place of municipalities. If you look for Italy, for example, Maya, you have different municipalities who are in charge of waste. Uh, in Oman, we have only BIA. BIA is in charge of all waste across the Sultanate as a whole. Our vision was very clear. It's about conserving the environment of uh, Oman for future generations. So three things, environment, our beautiful Oman and future generations. I'll just skip this very quickly. Uh, this is very much aligned with, with SDGs, with Oman's vision 2040. So usually I present this also to local audience to see how this relates to the to vision 2040. So since 2006, where the report was, uh, was uh, came out in 2006, in 2007, the company was established. Uh, 2009, a royal decree came out, giving us the responsibility to manage waste across Oman as a whole. In 2012, uh, we took over uh, healthcare waste out of Ministry of Health and we got the budget approved in 2012. So there was quite a period of time until we got the budget approved, but we went to work right away after 2012 and we started putting the infrastructure in place. So we were very, very busy during the uh, period of three years or so and putting the right infrastructure in place to ensure that we close all the dump sites that I shared with you, replace them with proper engineered landfills and transfer stations to support that. So we started taking over from the municipalities back in 2015. And we completed this process in four years and three years almost because we started end of 2015. We completed in 2019, uh, we're taking over all the waste management, municipal solid, solid waste services from the municipalities. And we took out all the dump sites out of service. So we no longer have the dump sites that I shared with you in the video. Uh, currently, all municipal waste goes to landfills, proper engineered landfills. Of course, I'll share with you what is it that we're going to go in terms of the next phase. This is nothing that we want to continue with. Healthcare waste goes to proper facilities uh, to, to get treated, uh, either by incineration or autoclave. Has this waste currently is being stored and some of it is being taken to an integrated facility in the northern part of the country. I'll talk about that as well. Waste streams is a major challenge because we still don't have full control over because it's a good portion of that, especially waste of good value goes outside the country. But we already have several uh, recycling facilities established in Oman, and right now we're working with the government to ensure that all of this waste ends up here in Oman, doesn't go outside. Uh, the way we structured the company internally, and this is how I'm gonna present today. I'm gonna talk to, the, talk to you about this separately. I'll start with municipal solid waste, and then I'll talk to you about industrial waste. Industrial waste basically is hazardous waste and then healthcare waste. And then I'll talk about all the different kind of waste streams. And you'll see all of this, all of these things, what we have done and how we're going to move towards circular economy. Let's talk about waste management principles and best practices. When you look into uh, best practices internationally, we're asked a lot in Oman, what are the best practices and how can we move towards uh, what other countries are doing in terms of waste management? And we usually uh, share with them our experience because we have visited most of these countries. We have seen what's being done. And sometimes it could look nice uh, from the outside, but it is extremely expensive. Let me explain why. 
first of all, in terms of principles, uh, when it comes to waste management, we usually talk about the hierarchy. Hierarchy basically talking about uh, doing less and less of disposal and trying to reduce the waste in the first place. So you want to reduce the waste and then you move towards reuse before you even talk about recycle. Let's try to reuse and then we can talk about recycling and then we can talk about recovery and waste to energy. And the least uh, preferable option is to dispose waste into landfills, either engineered, la engineered landfills or dump sites. We talk about circular economy a lot. So what is circular economy? It is the opposite of linear economy. What is linear economy? Linear economy, basically, you take, you mine, you take all of these uh, uh, raw material, virgin material. Uh, there's so much waste wastage coming out of that. You make different products. You use these products and you end up landfilling them or putting them in dump sites. Throughout the process, there's so much of fossil fuel is being used and less of renewable energy. So circular economy is basically the opposite. You try to close the loop. You try to reuse as much as possible, reduce the waste, uh, recycle, remanufacture, and repair, and use as much renewable energy as possible. I'm not going to go into details in this presentation today, but the, I think this the concept is very simple. Circular economy is about resource management. How can we, we manage our resources to the, to, the, to the best possible way, the most efficient way? It's not about recycling alone. Many people think circular economy is recycling. No, recycling is only a small part. There is much more to, to circular economy. It starts with the way how we mine uh, raw material. How do, we, uh, how do we manufacture our products, ensuring that they last longer, ensuring that we can recycle them easier. Recycle them easier. It even talks about even the, the model. So moving away from, from the concept of selling products to leasing products and such, so we can maximize the amount of time it stays within the ecosystem as much as possible. And you'll see this throughout the presentation as well. Basically, the circular economy was, uh, the concept was founded by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and this is the, the image that they use, and they separated towards circular, sorry, technical recyclables or, or biological recyclables. So what's being done in other countries? When we say best practices, especially Europe, if you look at Europe, we usually look at an example of Europe and some part of um, uh, Asia, like Japan, Taiwan, and Singapore. We see a lot of segregation at source. So you see many bins, not only one bin, you see four bins. Sometimes you even see seven bins and people segregate waste at source. And then you have the collectors come and collect that waste, transport it. It goes into sorting facilities. From sorting facilities, you take out all the different recyclables, paper, plastic, and others. You take the organic waste and you make composting out of that. You can compost it. And whatever is left of high calorific value could go into waste to energy. And all inert waste would only be uh, landfilled. Uh, so this is a concept in general. This is what's being done in general in other countries. There is one problem with this. It is very costly. So the usual way to do this, polluters would have paid pay fees or taxes to the government. Government needs to subsidize this whole process. So it subsidizes this process by paying uh, waste collectors. Uh, and waste collectors will end up paying investors and for with sorting facilities. Uh, sorting facilities would pay for whatever is left to go to uh, waste to energy plants, and they pay to landfill the, the waste. So overall, it's a very costly affair. And guess what? Unlike what people think, that there is wealth and there is gold in waste, usually no, it doesn't pay off. There is more cost than, than money out of waste. It is gold probably to the to the, these guys who are running the, the, the show, the waste collectors, the sorting facilities, and others, uh, and recyclables. But for governments and government entities like BIA, like our company, it's usually a cost. It costs so much to do to, to, to take care of all of this. Usually I present this to local authorities because they think that there's something being wrong. Why are we asking for government subsidies? Because we don't have taxes or fees in Oman yet. And they think that this is we're costing now government a lot. And usually this is the case in Europe and other countries. So what's the case in Oman right now? Uh, when it comes to municipal waste, we generated almost 1.9 million tons in 2020. This is only municipal waste, not other waste, only municipal waste. 1.9 million tons in 2020. On average, each person generates almost 1.2 kilograms of waste, of municipal waste per day. This is the global average. So we sit right at the global average in Oman. 
And it differs from one area to another, of course. If you look at urban, uh, urbanized uh, areas like the city, Muscat and other, others, it goes up. If you go to villages, it goes down. The composition of our waste, the majority of our waste is organic, 34%. 28% is plastic. And then you have paper around 13%, textile 7%, and so on. But majority is organic waste. So what is the situation now? We had over 318 um, dump sites across Oman. All of them are out of service. We don't use them anymore. We replaced them with almost 10 engineered landfills. We have 11 governorates in Oman. So we have currently 10 engineered landfills and the 11th engineered landfill is, is being constructed right now. So we will end up with almost 11 engineered landfills by end of this year. Uh, we have 14 transfer stations and around six more are being uh, constructed. Transfer stations are basically uh, logistical hubs to move waste from one place to another. We don't want to move waste with these small trucks, so we move them to maybe large semi-trailers. We compress that waste and we take them long, long haul distances. So let's look at the situation right now. I don't like these lines. I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by them, but it's okay. I think you can see the presentation anyhow. <laughs> so this is a video of the current situation. This is an engineered landfill, one of the engineered landfills. The picture you see right now is of one of these cells. It's already closed. Now we're, we're, we're using a second cell behind it, right behind it. Excuse this video, me, Mohammed. Sorry? If you stop sharing and reshare, they, they will go away. Let me try that. Meanwhile, I can comment that circular economy is about resource management is my next t-shirt. It's not about waste management, but about resource management. I found this very true, very refreshing to hear. Let me share again. Where is my presentation? Now I close my presentation. Sorry, guys. No worries. Okay. Okay, can you see my presentation? Perfectly. Perfectly. With no green uh, lines. Okay. okay, fine. Okay, so this is a clip of the existing situation, Luman. Oops. So these all dump sites are closed, no longer. We don't use them anymore. Replaced with, uh, we, we rehabilitated a few of them. Almost 23 of them are rehabilitated. So you see the difference between before and after. This is a rehabilitated site. This is a new engineered landfill. You see cell one and cell two is behind with proper facilities, even for the leachates is being treated. You see the leachate ponds on the side. Okay, sorry. This is a transfer station. You see how you have two hoppers where smaller trucks, you see the truck there? They move waste to larger, larger semi-trailers. This is all sanitization, sterilization of, uh, of bins. Okay. Now I'm sure you see a difference. It's much cleaner, prettier approach to waste, but is this something that we want to continue with forever? Of course not. And that's why I'm going to talk about circular economy. But this was a necessary, necessary, necessary step. We had to go through this phase. If you look at many of uh, other countries, uh, including Italy, where Maya is coming from, and other places in Europe, they had to go through this process. You were probably there 30 years ago, and you had to go through these phases in order to move towards circular economy. 
Now we have, we have um, outsourced all the services. We outsource all of our services. And basically service providers are responsible to do the pre-collection, providing the bins, making sure that they're maintained, they're cleaned and all, they do the collection, they manage the transfer stations, and then they take them to proper, the engineered landfills that I talked about. And somehow we try to recycle as much as possible. We have one, uh, one sorting facility. You're gonna see some pictures of that a little later. So we have 10 contracts right now. We manage them by KPIs. All we have to do is just make sure that they have their, they, the bins are maintained clean. They're of 75 meters maximum to any resident. Uh, they, they're sanitized, sterilized, no odors, no, no rodents and all of these things. So we manage by KPIs basically. Now, talking about the way forward, we, want, we have a target to divert 60% of municipal waste by 2025. So currently, most of that waste goes to landfills, but we intend to uh, divert 60% by 2025 and 80% by 2030. How are we going to do that? We're going to do it by doing recycling and recovery. Let's look at recycling. This is a sorting facility that we have currently in Oman. It's very costly. I talked to you about that. It doesn't make money. Sorry, guys, but it doesn't make money. It costs money. So usually it's very costly to run such operations. It takes a small quantity, only 200 tons per day. And the target is to divert 30% of the waste from that particular governor at Oman. This was a trial to see how we go in terms of sorting. And these are the kind of um, recovered material that we get, metals, plastic, paper, and things like that. The other thing that we think that we, we need to focus on, because simply because recycling is really expensive, we will do some segregation at source, but we will focus so much on waste to energy and most of our diversion is gonna happen by means of waste to energy. We have different plans in place. One is a major project in the, very close to Muscat, just outside the capital city of Muscat. Uh, it's going to take almost 4,500 tons of, uh, of municipal solid waste every day. This is almost 75% of the existing generation waste. We generate almost 5,600. So we're looking at 4,500 going to a single facility, uh, a little bit outside Muscat. It's going to create 200, 250 jobs. And the plant will generate almost 180 uh, megawatts of electricity. Uh, tender will be floated later this year, probably Q4 of this year to pre-qualify companies. And hopefully we can finish and close this by end of this year and we'll start the construction of this plant. This is a simple approach how waste energy works. Basically you take your waste, you incinerate it. And then with the combustion, you, uh, you're able to generate steam and uh, with steam you generate electricity. Uh, the other thing we're working on, you've seen that we have 34% of our waste is organic waste. So we're working on developing several biogas plants across Oman. Uh, we see that we can build almost 10 of them across the Sultanate. Uh, currently, we're working on these four locations. Barka, you're not familiar with the areas, but this is outside Muscat. One of the universities, along with this uh, wastewater company, we're working together on a joint project. Two companies, basically. We're working together with them to develop biogas plants. Uh, the concept is simple again. Uh, products will be biogas, which you can convert into electricity. And then you have what we call digestate, which could, use, which could be used as a fertilizer. Now, when it comes to industrial waste, we'll talk about healthcare waste first. We generate almost 4,500 tons uh, per annum of healthcare waste. We have three facilities across the uh, country. One facility has both incineration and autoclave. Autoclave is basically sterilization. Uh, and then we have one up north in Lua and one down south in, in, uh, in Thamrit. And we treat close to 100% of all healthcare waste that comes out of different hospitals, clinics, and others. You've seen in the video, the first video I shared with you, some of that waste used to be only, only five, six years ago, it used to end up in dump sites. Now it's all being treated. Nothing goes to landfills. This video shows you how healthcare waste is being managed. This is a special truck for only for healthcare waste. You see the yellow colors. This is one of the facilities. Mm -hmm. We have three facilities of such. Waste comes in designated yellow bins from hospitals and clinics.
So you have two kind of treatment uh, techniques. This is, uh, you'll see first what we call uh, autoclave. This is sterilization basically. It uses high pressure and high uh, temperature to sterilize waste. And then the other one is basically incineration. Some of the healthcare waste you still have to incinerate. You cannot just sterilize. As far as hazardous waste, we have um, a facility uh, up north in Suhar. Um, phase one is complete. This is going to be a, an integrated facility, the first of its kind in the region as a whole. The first phase is basically it comprises of, of storage facilities, uh, several kinds of uh, engineered landfills. A physical chemical treatment plant will be part of second phase and a thermal treatment will be part of the second phase. Second phase uh, construction, uh, there will be, um, be a tender that's going to be plotted this year, along with a tender to operate the, the facility for long term. This will take care of all, all kinds of hazardous waste that we generate in Oman. Again, this is a very small video about the existing facilities in Sahar. Okay, now we will move to waste streams and what do we intend to do with waste streams? Waste streams are owned by private generators and we encourage investments in, for different investors for different kind of waste streams to come into recycling. And we face some challenge there. Uh, it helps us with our diversion strategy, at least with some of that waste, but we have many challenges. Uh, the idea is we try to maximize the income to value as much as possible. Oman, unfortunately, imports most of uh, the goods and needs that we have in the country. Uh, and then we have users who generate different kinds of waste. And the idea is that we introduce logistic services, reverse logistics, we call them, for all of that waste to go back to facilities, uh, recycling facilities. And all the material, the raw material that comes out of recycling facilities should go to uh, secondary treatment. And then it goes back to the market as well. Secondary treatment basically will, will generate uh, different kinds of products. Let me give you an example. Tires. We, just, we, don't, we don't manufacture any tires in Iran. We import most of the tires. And you have generators, trucks, cars, and others. And then we... We want to introduce many, many opportunities for SMEs, small and medium enterprise, to, gen to collect that waste from different workshops, taking it to special recycling facilities. Uh, out of these recycling facilities, you're gonna have rubber uh, and other material like metal and others that will go into secondary treatment. Secondary treatment, basically you can manufacture, let's say flooring from, uh, from rubber and others, and it'll go back to the market and such. We're working with the government to ensure that there are proper regulations in place, fees like EPR or extended producer responsibility system, basically. We managed to introduce two of them. Uh, they will go into effect this September, one for tires and one for, for lead acid batteries. And we're presenting for others to the government to be, to be uh, introduced very soon. This is a video again, the last video, I promise. I'm not going to bombard you with videos, but a very small clip showing you what activities are there. This is a construction and demolition uh, uh, waste treatment facility. And there are others as well you're going to see. Construction and demolition waste, we have almost four to five million tons per annum. This is the largest in terms of volume in the one. Naturally, because of the weight that comes out of them. This is for end of life tires. This is for green waste, lead acid batteries. And this again for lead acid batteries, you see the bars coming out of there. This is the sorting facility in, uh, in Al Boremi. 
Ibris is not functional yet. Okay, let's go through them very quickly, one by one. For lead acid batteries, we already have two recycling facilities, one in, Mus uh, one in Muscat in the capital city, one down south. The capacity is almost 13,000 tons per year, and they generated uh, almost 150, 250 direct and indirect jobs. For construction demolition waste, we have two recycling facilities in 20 locations where we receive that construction demolition waste, and it could, could create, could end up creating almost 1,000, 2,500 jobs. One fish waste facility is being constructed very close to Muscat, outside Muscat. It's going to be ready by next year. Uh, again, 100, 200 indirect jobs, direct and indirect, indirect jobs. Paper and cardboard, unfortunately, most of it goes outside the border, across the border, but two facilities are already in place in Sohar, up north, uh, and they can create 250 to 400 jobs. One used cooking oil facility is being constructed uh, just outside Muscat. Again, 150 to 200 jobs. Green waste, two facilities, and more to come. Uh, two facilities, one uh, up, one up here, one up north, and one outside Muscat. Sorry, and one down south. 150 to 250. Two end of life tires facilities, 150 to 250 jobs. And we have a contract with one of the cement companies to start uh, supplying them by beginning of next year of what we call tire drive fuel. So we will cut tires and provide it as fuel to them. It will take almost 30,000 tons annually. For waste electrical and electronic equipment, we are working with the Japanese consortium to build a facility in Sohar. Right now we're looking into Sohar. That will provide almost 200 to 300 jobs. It will take care of almost all the waste that we we'll generate in Oman. Plastic waste is a major challenge because most of it was coming out of the scavengers and the dump sites. We no longer do that. So we are introducing a separate system to collect uh, plastic waste. We have introduced uh, reverse vending machines. You see these vending machines where you drop the bottles, you get some incentives out of the, by dropping the bottles. We will have different uh, collection containers in schools so we can encourage school children to bring in all of these bottles. And we'll have what we call drop-off centers across the Sultanate to, to collect not only plastic, but all kinds of waste. What can you do with the plastic? You can, uh, you can manufacture clothing out of it, uh, different products. Uh, we're also looking at reuse centers, uh, four centers in Oman. We are starting with one with the Sultan Qaboos University. This is the largest government university in Oman. So the first will go there. So it could take most of these items that we, we see here, textiles, books, appliances, all of these materials could go there and they could end up uh, being sold back in the market and all the benefit would go to charities. We see a major opportunity, major uh, job uh, generator, uh, generation opportunity when it comes to reverse logistics. I talked to, them, uh, to you about them briefly earlier. Reverse logistics basically is to collect waste from the generation points, take them to recycling facilities and others. Let me give you an example. We have almost 50 to 60,000 construction sites at any given time in Oman. So you can imagine if we introduce with the government mandatory that all of these contractors have to have a contract with one of these SMEs to provide them with special skips and to do the collection for them. So this will provide almost 1,000 uh, jobs for Omanis. And at the same time, it will help us to control all of this, what we call fly tipping, because most of this waste ends up in, in open areas in Oman across the, uh, across the Sultanate. By doing this, we are controlling all of this, managing, managing all of this waste. Reverse logistics and retail, only in Muscat, the capital, 6,000 restaurants and coffee shops. So you can imagine if we introduce all of these reverse logistics to collect cooking oil, collect all of these grease out of these restaurants, Similarly with workshop, more than 1,000 workshops where we can collect tires, batteries, the oils and all. These are just examples. So you can imagine if I go to all of the activities, the, the, the retail activities, the commercial activities, and if we do all of these collections, many, many jobs could be introduced when it comes to reverse logistics. This is very brief. I hope I didn't take long. I promised 30 to 40 minutes. I think I'm on time. Thank you. Been perfect on timing, Sheikh Mohammed. Wow, that's a lot to digest. Thank you very much um, for this insightful and in-depth um, presentation. I have lots of questions, but I would like to give the opportunity to the audience to, to ask any question or start any conversation. 
There is only one thing that I really would like to comment on, and it, it really stays with me, is that when you made the reference um, to the library of things, and the, you didn't say library of things, but you said object, we can enhance the life of the object by um, having them rented instead of uh, wasted, basically. And all the talk about resource management, it, may, it really stuck with me because I believe in the last century, as, a, as consumers, as private, as consumer, we always talk about um, our own things. So we tend to be very individualistic, while as a human species, really, the human being succeeds when it does community things. So I think that the philosophy that you touch upon with the resource management and the circular economy, that's really key to address our grand challenges. So the climate change, the resource management, et cetera, in the next 20 years. So I believe this kind of project are really key for our success as a species, really. So thank you for that. And thank you for your hard work on it. Okay, I'm full of questions, but if there is anyone from the audience that wants to ask anything to shake, um, okay, Yelena, I can see you have one. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, Sheikh Mohammed, thank you so much for your wonderful, very interesting and very thorough presentation. And I think Sultanate of Oman has a lot to be proud of in terms of the achievement so far and, and the planning, which obviously uh, I have full confidence that it will be implemented in, in, in good time. So very, very well done to you, your team and everybody who's involved in this uh, initiative. Uh, my question revolves around developing a culture of consumption or how to deal with, with waste. So what kind of initiatives is BEA or our parallel entities actually driving to um, get this uh, reduce, uh, re reduce, reuse, recycle type of spirit in into people's uh, lifestyles in general, from children up to, up to adults? Thank you, Jelena. I think it's extremely important, and we got this from the outset, that we need to work in terms of um, raising awareness, but we have taken it in a phased manner uh, in terms of addressing uh, immediate, uh, immediate uh, requirements that we had at different, the different stages that we have passed by. Um, we have established what we call the Environmental Center of Excellence um, almost um, five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. I'm losing sense of time right now, but almost five years ago. And part of what we call the Environmental Center of Excellence, we have what we call BIA Academy. BIA Academy, BIA basically, BIA is the company name, but BIA means environment in Arabic. For everybody who doesn't speak Arabic, BIA means environment. So BIA Academy is basically in charge of um, community outreach, running all of these awareness programs. Um, uh, we... Prior to COVID-19, we, in 2019, we reached out to almost 130,000 students across the Sultanate. And we're looking at a very specific age group. We're looking at uh, classes from fourth grade to, uh, to eighth grade, if I'm not mistaken. I forgot the, the, uh, the grades, but fourth to eighth grade. So we're very specifically looking at uh, this segment to ensure that the next generation will be able to help us in terms of all of the things that we're trying to achieve. One of which, for example, is a reduction of waste generation. We're looking at 1.2 kgs per person per day right now. The idea is that we drop it below one kg per person per day by 2040. So we're looking at a generation or two to, to reduce that, 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 uh, that quantity. Uh, we talk about things when we first started the inception of services. We were talking about the right approach in terms of getting rid of waste ensuring that it goes inside the bin, not outside the bin. So we're not, we're not even talking about recycling to uh, that stage. Uh, we're talking about making sure the lids are closed. And then we start talking about, okay, the life cycle of each different, each and different kind of uh, waste streams that you've seen in, during the presentation. We focus so much on, on uh, reduction of waste, especially in seasons like Ramadan. Ramadan is, uh, is, uh, is a festive season where people, yes, they fast during the day, but unfortunately during the evening, we consume more than normal days. 
So most of that waste of food goes into uh, go into wastage. So we have we run campaigns in terms of reduction of waste during that particular month, um, and we've seen the effect. Now we have we we see kids uh, showing their parents the right approach of uh, managing waste or reducing waste. So this is a continuous thing. It's not going to stop. You have to continue educating them and uh, look into your priorities by educating them, not just going random. Uh, we're trying to. We're trying to look into how we could utilize, take advantage of big data. We are collecting so much data from the field. So how can we take that big data and put it into artificial intelligence to learn more about behavioral of people with the de with demographics in each and every uh, location in the country? You have to realize Oman has many expats. Almost 60% uh, are Omanis, but 40%, I don't figure, I think 57% are Omanis and the rest are expats. So you have people coming from abroad a lot. And they come from different backgrounds. So you need to understand that all of these different behaviors. So when you run your, your awareness campaigns, you need to make them very targeted towards these, uh, these different segments within the society, society. So probably AI could help us in making very, very much targeted campaigns towards the different kind of segments. Thank you, Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, we do have another question for you from Giulio Neto. Yelena, did that reply to your first question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sheikh Mohammed. Good. So from Giulio Neto, Sheikh Mohammed, in your point of view, what environmental waste use management and training issues will require the most attention in 10 years? I mean, looking for the next generation as you started in your presentation, what do you think um, is the issues that we should focus on when it comes to waste and resource management? There are different issues to be tackled. We still have look, to look at the basics, basically, in terms of uh, the, the way we handle waste. We still struggle in terms of handling waste. You have to realize that the sometimes the environment is not not much, of, uh, the climate is much, not much of a help for us. Uh, and uh, people tend to get rid of the waste quickly outside the bins. And uh, they do not want to touch these bins and others. So we still struggle in terms of normal practices and behaviors. And the issue is that it's not only, not only awareness. We're still struggling when it comes to enforcement. So we need to make sure that there is enforcement also. It's a carrot and stick basically. So the, the stick is not there yet. And I'm a firm believer. I can run all these awareness campaigns that I want, but before having, before, be, without having proper enforcement in place, it's not going to work. We have seen it in many aspects of our lives. For example, speeding, it used to be a major problem in Oman, but it didn't stop with all of these awareness campaigns. It stopped only or it improved once we had all of these radars across the street. So similarly here, unless you make sure that the regulations are in place, enforcement is in place, you will not be able to achieve anything. We have a problem in littering. If you go to all of these uh, tourist areas, uh, public areas, uh, they, ended up, they end up being littered after each and every, ca every uh, holiday. So these are things that we also focus on. And then we slowly move towards recycling and circular economy and all of that. I, I think the, the beginning is all of these basics. We still have to do more in terms of basic Basically, before we move to the more complex issues that we talk about here in this, in this presentation today. Yes, having good foundation, good pillars yes. Is, is, yes. Is, is key to move uh, any step forwards. Uh, okay, uh, Julia, I hope that um, reply to your question. And Rowena. Thank you very much, um, Sheikh Mohammed. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, in my part of the world, we, my part of the world being the Caribbean region, the issue of recycling has is, is been quite challenging for us. Um, but it typically boils down to the point that you just raised, that of enforcement, um, which, is, which is a problem generally across the board. And I was wondering what enforcement mechanisms have you introduced in Oman or are looking at introducing to be able to contain the problem? Um, compliance. Okay, you touched upon a very important, this is an extremely important question. We, unfortunately, BIA is not, not a regulator, so we cannot enforce any, any of these measures. We work with our partners closely. Uh, we have uh, the environmental authority and the uh, municipalities 
uh, who are who are more they they have that enforcement or that uh, regulatory power more than the uh, as a company. We're working closely with them. Unfortunately, most of these laws that we have in place are outdated. We do not have and at, at this stage, as I speak, we do not have a clear policy when it comes to waste management in the country. So, however, we were, we work closely with all of these authorities, and we already have drafts in place. We hope by this year we will have a policy issued in terms of waste management that will address things like the diversion rates that we have talked about, the 60% and the 80%. It will tackle issues like, for example, the need for recycling, the need for waste to energy and others. Uh, and then enforcement, uh, we will have clear uh, enforcement targets when it comes to these authorities or even BIA. If we can get at least enforcement when it comes to operational aspects, I think we should have some sort of, um, uh, some sort, sort of a power to enforce uh, certain rules when it comes to our bins at least. So it is something we're still work in progress, but it is a major challenge because it's out, it's out of our control. Rowena, does this reply to your um, question? Do you have anything to add? Yes, no, thank you. Actually, that's, that's, um, I guess it's, it's um, not unexpected. I think it's a, it's, it's a very difficult thing. What I have found though, I just wanted to add is that perhaps the pandemic has a bit of a blessing in that respect because with the ban on plastics, um, people do not tend to shop as much and have as, 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 as many disposable items. They will visit the, the store more regularly. Um, and obviously with, with being confined to homes, people are not terribly happy about having waste around their homes and with curfews and lockdowns. So perhaps now is a time to, uh, for governments to capitalize on this environment to get people attuned to a different way of um, accumulating waste and also disposing particularly of municipal waste. But thank you very much for that response. Just to comment on that, actually, well, it depends on different cultures. You, you, may, you may relate because you live in the Bahamas. I lived in Miami for a few years in Miami. And you know what happens when you have a hurricane coming towards you? So what do you go? You see people going running to, to supermarkets and shopping more than what they need. That's what happened when we have all of these lockdowns in one. So people purchase tend to purchase more than what they want. So you end up with more waste. So unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's just, it's a panic thing. Uh, they panic and they go to support, they end up purchasing more waste. That's what we, we have witnessed. Well, that's very, very insightful. Uh, Yelena, do you have a second question? Yes, please, if I may. Um, I've seen some initiatives around the world where governments are starting to hold producers or companies uh, that are actually generating the, the source of the waste, let's say, uh, accountable in terms of packaging. So they are trying to drive these, uh, these companies to use more sustainable packaging, to use less packaging, etc. Do you see anything in Oman in your context uh, that, is, that is driving in that direction or do you think it might drive in that direction in the future? Well, um, it started with, um, with um, uh, single-use plastic ban. Uh, environmental Authority already banned single-use plastic bags of certain uh, thickness. And the intention is that they will ban all single-use plastic uh, across the country. Uh, packaging, I'm not sure if they're going to go to that extent in terms of the material that comes in packaging, but it is extremely important. But um, you have to understand if uh, some of these initiatives, for example, in Europe, it, it happens as and from the European Commission is being enforced across all the manufacturers and nothing enters the European uh, Union uh, without having to meet these strict standards. So it has to happen across the GCC, I believe. It's very difficult for Oman as a small market to, to enforce this on products coming from outside unless they're manufactured locally. So I think with single-use plastic, it started and it's going to continue with all single-use plastics, but I'm not sure if this is going to go to packaging as well. In terms of holding uh, the uh, producers responsible, I mentioned what we call the extended producer responsibility schemes. Uh, we, we have introduced two of them for batteries, car batteries, that is, lead-acid batteries and for tires. Uh, we see four more coming. 
Uh, we're working right now on a system uh, for or a scheme for plastic bottles, PET bottles. Uh, uh, another one for for, uh, uh, for lubricant oil, uh, for end of life vehicles. And the last one is for, for electronic and electrical uh, equipment. So four more EPRs will be introduced soon. Thank you, Sheikh. I actually add um, a question about the streams, the waste streams. When you, I was very interested when you started talking about the secondary, so the, the secondary treatment. What's your vision for that? So once you have recycled tires, and as you said, lots of goods that are in a manner imported. So I guess there is no um, industry yet. So is it your vision, your plan to also develop the downstream industry to then create all these goods and being Oman goods produced in Oman? Because that will be quite revolutionary for the internal economy. We believe it's extremely important. See, if you want to maximize the in-country value, you need to you need to close the gap even there. That's that will be the missing puzzle out of the whole thing because you need to introduce uh, further in the secondary treatment. We already have some sort of facilities. For example, if you look at paper, uh, whatever paper comes out of uh, recycling facilities would go into uh, paper mills or, or packaging companies and all of that. We have an industry already, and I think there is more room to invest probably in two more facilities for such uh, such a uh, stream. Uh, when it comes to tires, some of these two, uh, one of these two facilities that I mentioned, they manufacture in a small scale, they manufacture floorings and others. And mm -hmm. see, by introducing these recycling facilities, automatically you could encourage more and more investments if the raw material is readily available locally with the, uh, at an acceptable price, you can introduce more and more of these facilities. So what we do, we run so many of these roadshows. We encourage youngsters to come to, uh, to us to understand what opportunities are there. We are running well, an accelerator program right now for uh, along with universities and colleges. Uh, we're working with another authority to introduce also an incubator program. So basically all of these are trying to encourage all of these innovations in terms of utilizing all of this raw material that comes out of recycling facilities. For example, the plastic that we, 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 we collect right now or we will start collecting. We are already in talks with one of these 3D printing companies who want to take this plastic and use it as element, I think they call them, all of these threads that go into 3D printers. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be out of the box in terms of the usage of all of this, all of this recycled material. Yeah, and I'm just curious, at the moment when you say that the paper and the cardboard mainly go internationally, it goes, so go treated internationally. Do you pay them to treat the, the material, the waste, or do they pay you to get the, the material? It's not ours in, as a company, as BIA. Um, yeah. uh, the paper has value. And yeah. the generators of paper, basically hypermarkets and other, other generators, they get paid by, the, they run auctions and they get paid for, for, for the paper that's being collected from them. Yeah. Uh, they don't pay, they get paid. They get. And there is a big market across the border in neighboring countries. Uh, unfortunately, most of the major players in the market are, are recyclers across the, uh, the border. So their interest is to secure all of this material for their own facilities. We're trying to break that. Right now we're working with the government to ban any exports of paper because we already have two facilities in the country. So the idea is no, keep it in Oman. Uh, maximize the value in Oman and ensure that all of this paper that comes out of these facilities would go into packaging material companies and the paper mills and others after that. Yeah, I think the downstream is very fascinating and how that would yeah, be. The proximity is extremely important. As you understand, you come from that background, you know, proximity is extremely important. It doesn't make sense that you generate waste and then you take it for treatment like three, 400 kilometers away and you you emit all of these uh, uh, gases by taking it by trucking and all of that to, to other countries. So you keep it within a close circle as much as possible. Especially in a country that needs raw material. Exactly. So I found this very insightful and it really could change the economy from the inside. Is anyone else, does anyone else have any question? And sorry, Mulai, I didn't read your comment during the holy month of Ramadan, waste growth over 40% the normal time. What is so? Because is people are partying and so there is more food waste or there are any other reason apart from that? I'm just curious here. 
gathering. They we gather more in Ramadan. Maybe not during these last two years because of COVID nineteen, but usually it's a festive season where you for a full month uh, we fast during the day, but we <laughs> we in, we tend to cook more more than what we need. So there is more more food being wasted as a result. So it's mainly food waste. Yeah. Okay. So and during the end of that uh, month, we have. Um, what we call Eid, if you're familiar with Eid, it's more like Christmas yeah. for you. And uh, usually you have feasts again, and uh, so much of meat is being consumed, and again, so much of wastage. I um, I had some of the most beautiful days in Eid, actually. It was, it was really a lovely um, celebration. I Is there anyone else that has a couple of questions? Otherwise, I, I'll ask another, another two. If you're not tired, Sheikh Mohammed, to reply to our not question. At all, not at all, not at all. Yeah, if, so I, I wonder, since you've been working on this project for years now, and uh, so if money wouldn't be a problem, you can do whenever, whatever you want, what would be your solution? Um, what will be the ideal system? So let's, let's say you have the power of enforce everything, you have the power of education, you have the power of uh, money. What would you do? What is a way system where um, everything really works? Well, money is, uh, is, is, is a challenge always. I wouldn't say that. We used to have uh, a healthy budget prior to the, to, the, to the financial situation with the COVID-19 and others. But it remains to be a challenge because you have to remember that it's being subsidized by the government. Until now, we do not have uh, waste, uh, any fees in, ter in terms of uh, waste management for the public. So it is being subsidized by the government. Um, and that's going to be a challenge because uh, we'll we'll move along with the with the economic conditions and then how we be, how we're being subsidized. Um, the way f the the challenge is mostly in in moving things faster than what we uh, faster than what's happening right now. Uh, for example, the waste energy project we have been working on this for almost eight years right now, and we're yet to float a tender because it's very heavily regulated and we have to work with other authorities and uh, we have to do some convincing, you know how it works. In Europe, usually you have to do so much of homework, getting the approvals, making sure that you get also uh, the public agreement on, on such plans. We have different kind of bureaucracy here where, where things get delayed and uh, sometimes you wish that things are a little faster. Uh, we wish that the government can see the bigger picture in terms of circular economy and move fast in terms of, for example, banning uh, the the export of uh, of waste streams across the globe, across the across the border. So these are the main challenges that we face more than anything else. So systemic challenges, really. Yes. yes. And not detailed one. Yeah. Good. That's very uh, interesting. Yes, Yelena. I'm sorry. This is uh, this is this will be my third question, but it's a very very fascinating topic for me, which I'm also quite passionate about. Uh, you're mentioning Sheikh Mohammed that uh, that the financial aspect uh, is is a real problem, and and that you are you're reliant on government subsidies. Now, if uh, hypothetically speaking, if you would uh, be able to. Um, enforce things like um, separating the different types of, of products like the plastics and the metals and so on and so forth uh, just by, by the consumer directly separating those for you. So Bea just comes in and takes the metals and takes the plastics that are already pre-sorted. How much do you think of an impact would that make on you financially or how much relief would that give you uh, financially as a company? Okay, do you want the <laughs> direct answer? Uh, it will affect us negatively. So you'll end up having more cost. The, you have to understand, this is a logistics business. This is a logistics business. So basically, if you are to introduce a second bin, if you're asking, uh, asking me if we can introduce a second bin for segregation, let's say for plastic, another one for, for, for or let's say uh, glass, and then you have metals and others. Uh, it's all added cost because uh, somebody has to, uh, to make sure that they're segregated properly. You have a second and third fleet of trucks coming and picking them up. You have to build special sorting facilities. 
so it doesn't pay back. Uh, all, all waste of value doesn't end up with you. Metals will not end up with you. Naturally, it doesn't end up with you. You already have an informal sector going around, collecting all of these metals, and they're utilizing it. So what ends up with us is all of this waste that's of, that's of no value. So we're trying to be smart of how we are gonna collect all of this waste. For example, with plastic, we're introducing these schemes that I've talked to you about, the reverse vending machines, the bins in schools and others. This could be of little value, but even with that, you still need support. For example, running the reverse vending machines, we have strategic partners who are, uh, who are chipping in some of that cost and helping us to do this collection. Otherwise, it's not feasible. It's not, uh, the, the value is not there. Simply, it is not there. It's a fact, people uh, do not understand this because from the outside, it seems that plastic, metals, they have major value, but unfortunately, it costs you more to do all of this collection, segregation at source and sorting, it's more costly than, than uh, the value. Unless you're collecting metals, yes, with metals, that's a different case. But metals don't end up with us. They go somewhere else before they reach us. So am I getting this right that you're saying that it's more effective for you to collect everything and sort it out yourself? that you actually have people doing it? See, the informal sector is collecting all of the waste of value. So we don't intend to, to uh, and, um, disrupt that. We, we would love to work with them, just bring up the standards. And they know what they're doing very efficiently. They do it properly. But it's just a matter of bringing up the standards, making sure that things are done right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then let the market uh, work with that. And uh, they have a market with the, all of these new recyclers and others. They could work with recyclers. When it comes to this um, segregation of, uh, let's say, paper, uh, uh, plastic, uh, glass at home, this is more cost than revenue. Simple, more cost than revenue. If you look at any system in Europe and any, any country, it ends up costing the government more than what they earn out of that. The only thing that makes it up for, for them is that they charge fees. They charge you the EPRs, they charge you fees, they charge you taxes, and that's how they make the money. But the government, if it ends up subsidizing, there is more cost than the money. That that comes as a new for me. I know that they will, I know that even if they do the recycling, even in Western country like UK or Italy, they do the recycling at home. They actually bring everything together, put together, and then uh, they have this machine that works for weight and redivide everything. So I always thought, why are they doing that? So of course. Yes. Let me give you figures. Um, let me give you figures, Maya. So let me give you figures. I'll, I'll talk numbers. Do you realize that Germany, for example, Germany comes as one of the one of the best examples when it comes to waste management. Many many people would think that Germany is the best country to do, to manage waste and recyclables. Do you know that only only forty percent of recyclables come out of out of these different color bins? 60% still comes out of the black bin, the black bin with everything all together. So they still have to go and take them to sorting facilities. Sorting facilities are really expensive. They're not efficient. You're lucky if you can divert 30%. 30% is a beautiful target. And beyond 30%, it's much, much, much more expensive because you go with more automation than others. So only 60%, sorry, only 40% comes out of the colored bins. In the UK, do you realize that 15% out of these colored bins get rejected because it's not segregated right. For example, pizza boxes. Pizza boxes are paper, but do you know that the minute that they're stained with little water or with little grease, they're no longer good. So you cannot use them anymore. So there's so much, and this is all costly. And you have to run awareness campaigns. You have to sort them. You have to segregate them properly. So it ends up being a cost, but they're doing it because the law says so. You have a very strict, Low yeah. by the Euro European Commission, and you have to abide by that. You have to reach the targets. You have to recycle 70% by, uh, by 2030, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And the only way to do that is by money, money, money. You inject money in there. And people, you and other citizens pay for that, for that particular uh, process. Yeah, I also want to, to think that they do in the hope of uh, a long-term education. So people after 40 years of recycling will actually understand. Oh, no. You stop for 15 days and you see the result. And guess what? Now you have many immigrants as well in Europe. So immigrants come with different cultures and they come with different. Uh, so you have to start all over again. Well, that's an interesting topic. I was just interested in knowing... Uh, 
because I don't know. So it's a genuine question. If you have a kilo of paper, let's say a unit of paper, is it from a circular econom economy point of view, is it better to use it as fuel? Is it better to recycle if you cannot reuse it? Is it better to recycle as material or is it better to recycle as energy? What is that? See, recycling is always, um, I'll tell you my personal views. Yeah. As much as you could recycle, you do that. Recycling is better if you see even the hierarchy. Recycling comes as a, as a higher priority than, than recovery. Yeah. However, I'm a firm believer that when you look at that, you need, you need not to forget that, that we talk about sustainability. Sustainability is not only environment. Sustainable, there is, there is an econo economic part and an element as well in, in, in the sustainability. So we, at what cost are you willing to do that? At what cost are you willing to do that? So you need to strike a balance sometimes to see whether you're better with this option or that option. Yeah. So if you're able to extract all of this material at an economical cost and making use out of it to produce other material, other, uh, other products, be it, very good. That's, a, that's, that's an excellent thing. But if it's going to cost you so much to do that, I'm not, I'm not with that. It's better that you put it in, in, inside an incinerator and uh, recover the energy that comes out of it. Yes, I was thinking about the actual present uh, effectiveness of it. Yeah, that's as great. long as you have the facilities to do that, to recycle, and uh, you do it at a very efficient manner, you separate it, you segregate it at source at a very uh, effective manner, yes, fine. I, I'm a firm believer you go to recycling. Yeah. But as long as you're missing all of these things, you put it inside of uh, waste energy plant is much better. We should do a dedicated LSA on, on yes. a people of people, yeah, in, in specific countries. So we have a question for Julia Neta, which I'm not sure I understand. Julia, do you want to um, ask this directly to Sheikh Mohammed? Due to the nature of waste management business and service, we may ask that you complete a full background. Ask you. I didn't understand. Are you willing to comply? I didn't understand. What do you mean by are willing? Are we, am I willing to comply? Yeah, maybe um, referring to the company. Really, is it? Are you touching the topic of the illegal waste management and how to address that? You can you unmute the Julio and ask him to ask a question. Probably I didn't understand the question. Yeah, I did. I did unmute. Can you, Julio? Yelena, could you try to unmute him? I did, but I didn't succeed. Yeah, because also the illegal, uh, if this is the topic, also the illegal waste management is big. No, I see something about the uh, standing out from the crowd in terms of competitors. I'm not sure if he's referring to his company or our company. We, we are a government company. We don't compete with companies. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure what he's referring to exactly. I didn't understand the question. So if you can rewrite the question, Julio, since we cannot open the mic, please rewrite the question. Thank you. Yeah, I somehow seems not to be able to unmute you. Now, well, 200 to 250 jobs are offered. Well, I will let Sheikh Mohammed to reply to that, but if they really will be able to, to unlock. To what particular area, Nawal? Um, because I, I gave a full presentation uh, according to different streams. There are different kind of jobs, job opportunities in each and every stream. Overall, we believe that if we do things right, if we have a complete uh, uh, cycle, we could offer up to 10,000 jobs if things are done right. But I'm not sure what you're referring to exactly. If we don't take into consideration the downstream industry that could be developed in the years, which I think is key. Yelena. Apologies again. Uh, so uh, spinning off on the employment uh, aspect of this, what kind of uh, conversation are you having with the institutes of higher education or with the, you know, with, with the younger generation in terms of preparing for the types of jobs that your industry will be offering in the future? We've done several roadshows. Uh, see, the BIA as, as an organization, uh, there, are, there are limited kind of number of jobs in terms of BIA as a whole. Uh, but in terms of the industry, uh, the, when it comes to circular economy and others, we've done, we've done several rounds in universities, colleges, 
and we host many students. We provide, we provide as well internship programs, training programs uh, for them to understand what opportunities are there within the sector as a whole. So we don't want to limit this to, uh, to waste management. We would like to see what opportunities are there in the waste sector as a whole. We would like to encourage more of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so it's generally, but we're working on with colleges one to one. Fantastic. So Nawal uh, confirmed that was exactly our question. So thank you, Yelena, to to interpret it, and thank you, Nawal. I hope that was exhaustive. Rowena. Thank you very much, um, Sheikh Mohammed. Having lived in Miami, I think you will understand my next question um, from my context. I wondered whether Oman had any experience with cruise ship uh, in their waters or ships in their waters and how they manage or handle the disposal of waste. As you, I'm sure, are aware, we in the Bahamas, we're a big, big cruise shipping agency, I mean, sorry, area, and we have had issues of dumping in our waters. Um, we're a very small country and definitely don't have the resources, I think, to be able to police that to the extent that it requires. And I wondered whether or not either Oman has an, a, any, any experience or you yourself personally would have addressed this issue at any point in time. Thank you. Um, cruise ship industry is picking up in Oman. But uh, shipping industry as a whole, uh, Oman is an oil uh, gen uh, generating country, and we have so much of this uh, shipping routes across Oman, and also with the Hormuz, uh, uh, Strait of Hormuz, and others. So marine uh, marine littering has always been a challenge. However, it is not within our scope. It's not within our responsibility. I know that uh, the environmental uh, authority is dealing with this matter. It's a main challenge, but it's a global issue rather than a local issue because so much of this waste, even uh, you'll, you'll see that it, it crosses borders from international waters and others. So policing all of this is a major challenge, as I understand. However, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, shed light on that because that's not, in the, not within our scope. So we do not, we do not deal with that uh, as, a, as a company. Thank you, Sheikh Mohammed. Well, in Italy, we are plagued by cruise ships. So if you want, we can give you some of the, <laughs> of the sector down there. Okay. Is there anything else um, you would like to alight? Anything, any message you really want to get across to any country which is the same uh, development level and wants to do the jump that you have done in the last seven years really is there a recommendation because I noticed from the timeline that it took you seven years to put together the organization and then you were very quick in doing um, the first activities and the necess necessary one so if someone needs to do the, the kind of the same change that you have done what kind of advice what kind of message would you like to give um, do it within the context of the country itself. You need to strategize to what's best, what best fits your country. And uh, it is, it's not one size fits all. Uh, as you have seen, I'm, I'm talking about not pushing so much for recycling at any cost and going for waste energy. If you talk to many of uh, our colleagues and friends in Europe, or consultants from Europe, they would push for more of these segregation at source, sorting facilities and recycling, which comes at a cost. This is just one example. So always think in the context of your own country, you put your own strategy. We did not, sorry for any, any consultants here, but we did not go out for consultants when we put our strategy in place. We used experts whenever we needed experts in some areas that we did not understand very well. However, we did it ourselves here. We saw what best fits the country and how we can manage this within the local context. Not everything fits every country. We are at different levels. Uh, so you would be the judge better than anyone else how to do this. Now, uh, in terms of circular economy, um, it starts with you individually. You need to understand how you can contribute, to, uh, contribute towards that. In terms of your, your behaviors, your purchases, uh, how you how you look into things as resources more than anything else 
that's the most important way to look at, at, uh, at circular economy. Sorry, I'm making it very short. It's a very, very short presentation, but we, were, we will be very happy to support, to lend oh, and share our experience with, and learn from others as well, as we learn from many other countries. We'll be happy to share our, our experiences. I know that we have been, we've been recently talking to different countries in the region, our, our neighbors here. We've been talking to countries like Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and others. They approach us to understand how we manage things here in Oman. There is such and a need of luck. Yeah, there is such a need of a knowledge sharing platform, really. And we'll be happy to share whatever we can do. And I'm sure we'll, we'll learn as we go as well from them. And that's a fantastic follow up idea. I have a quick question from uh, Mulay Dres. Uh, I hope I, I'm saying your name right. Uh, please, Sheikh Mohammed. Is municipal waste in Oman generate le uh, leaking? Le leachate, I guess, was leaking. It seems that 35% of municipal waste is made of organic waste. So do you have a, a leaking problem? Yes, he's, he's referring to leachate, yes. Leachate. We, um, uh, yes, well, there is leachate. Leachate is the black liquid that comes out of yeah. waste. Uh, it's a toxic material. Yes, we generate leachate. Uh, it is, I wouldn't say it's very, very high, but it is reasonable. We were surprised in some locations we started uh, generating leachate prior to what we were supposed to, uh, to generate. Uh, we have currently, we have uh, two beautiful facilities out of the 10 landfills that we have. Two of them are fitted with uh, reverse osmosis facilities to, to uh, treat this leachate. One we just launched last week. So we, uh, we, uh, we treat all of this uh, leachate and generate water, water we use for uh, for uh, greenery and other things within the landfill. And uh, the other eight landfills, they have only normal ponds where, uh, where that water evaporates and all. But in, in average, yes, there is good quantity of water or leachates coming out, depending on the region. Every region is different. And do you have any treatment? By the way, thank you because I'm learning new things while we go along. Is there any, new, any, any treatment for that? Yes, well, two, as I said, two locations. We have invested in, uh, in the reverse osmosis uh, technology to, uh, to treat the leachate. And the uh, byproduct basically is, is water, pure water, but we use it only for, for, for greenery around, for greening the, the landfill around the, around the landfill. And, uh, and then you have this black substance that goes back into the landfill. Fantastic. Thank you. Hamid. Can you unmute yourself? Would you like to ask a question? Otherwise, Sheikh Ahmed. Sheikh Ahmed. Sorry, uh, sorry, I thought somebody else is. Uh, she was calling someone else. Uh, thank you, Sheikh Mohammed, for excellent uh, presentation, and thank you, Maya, for excellent moderation as well. And I uh, really appreciate the efforts by B.I. and Oman, and I uh, wish you all success and see your work uh, uh, in, from one success to another. Uh, in addition to the uh, recycling you do, uh, do you think one day in Oman, we, in addition to uh, recycling, we will go towards upcycling as well? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheikh Ahmed. Um, see, we try to encourage upcycling as much as possible. I mentioned some examples during the presentation. For example, Plastic happens to be probably one of the material that loses, loses most of its characteristics once, once you recycle. Actually, you don't cycle it, you don't recycle it. When you take plastic and you, uh, and you generate all of these pellets and they, they go back into making bags and others, you're down cycling the, the, the plastic. So one, one area we're looking at is how can we upcycle by using it in different products. For example, I've mentioned the 3D printing. 3D printing is a good example of, of upcycling by, by taking this plastic and, uh, and generating filaments or these threads that go into, into 3D printers and making different products out of that. Um, some items you don't lose value, so you're upcycling, for example, metals, you don't have a problem with that. The idea is how can we make better, and pro better value added products out of that? Uh, so we encourage as much as possible. End of the day, these are all private investments and we try to encourage young Omanis with innovative ideas to bring up ideas to upcycle rather than downcycle. 
there is a question Thank if you, you allow me Maya or you want to take care of the questions because I see unless Sheikh Ahmed has a follow up uh, comment if he if he is happy Thank yes we do uh, Thank you very much uh, Sheikh Mohammed it's uh, uh, what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a clarification uh, from Giulianetto from, from the question of before. And he said, there is no easy answer to the problems of combined economic growth and environmental sustainability. Yes, absolutely. I refer to the legal regime applicable to impact assessment and environmental licensing, which is a vast chapter. If you want to comment on it. Yeah, there is no answer of combining economic growth and environmental sustainability. That's why circular economy talking uh, talks about decoupling growth from, from, uh, uh, from all of these sustainability activities and all. Uh, so it's not easy, but I think with, with, uh, with the circular economy, you could see economic growth by also moving towards sustainable initiatives and others. In terms of um, legal regime, yes, environmental authority is very strict in terms of uh, the, uh, all of these studies, the impact assessments and environmental licensing. That's the responsibility of the environmental authority. And uh, we work closely with them. Some cases we try to enforce even more stringent uh, uh, standards with investors. Uh, uh, European standards, for, for example, is a benchmark we can look at. And we enforce that when it comes to the the recycling of batteries uh, because it's something new to the country and we work closely with the authorities to improve and um, these standards and make sure that they're up, up, up high. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to answer. I was going to ask if you had any particular uh, country that you look at when you were implementing your own system. So the EU was one of the group. Good. Yeah. Yusuf al Kamzari, are there notable initiatives from large companies or a small and medium enterprise in Oman to adopt a circular economy within their organization? So are they being proactive? Yep. There are different initiatives here and there. Uh, for example, the Petroleum Development Oman, the, uh, this is an oil and gas company. They're, they're looking at initiatives within the green initiatives. Uh, and uh, the same thing is happening with other companies. For example, Mazun Dairy which I represent, I sit on the board of Mazun Dairy. They have their own, um, their own uh, biogas plant within Mazun Dairy and all of these uh, animal manure and others would go into, into the, the plant. So it's being, the loop is within the facility itself. So there are, there are different initiatives here and there when, when it comes to circular economy. Good. Um... I think there was a lot to digest. I think we have future next step of creating a knowledge platform, a knowledge sharing platform for the country to learn one from each other, like a peer to peer mechanism really. And if no one else have any other question or Sheikh Mohammed, if you maybe want to say a couple of words for closing it before I pass the, the word to Yelena. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I added some words you asked me prior to this, but then we went back to the questions. But nevertheless, I would like to uh, thank, uh, thank you for the beautiful moderation and for arranging, uh, for organizing all of us uh, with the questions and others. I would like to uh, thank uh, Kafrad, uh, represented by Sheikh Ahmad and Jelena. Thank you for, for having me here. It was a pleasure and uh, we're always happy to share uh, our story and uh, to learn from others as well. Thank you and have a good evening. Fantastic. Thank you, Sheikh Mohammed. So I join you in being grateful really for this half an hour together to all of you, to your insightful presentation and to Yelena and Sheikh Mohammed to inviting me moderating. It's been an absolute pleasure. So Yelena, if you want to um, to close the session, I thank all the audience as well for the interesting Q&A and see you soon. Thank you very much, Maya, and thank you so much to Sheikh Mohammed for a very, very thorough and interesting presentation. I think we've all learned a lot. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, room to, for development, for conversations, and for a knowledge exchange that is being generated through the opportunity of the conversation with you and uh, for the questions that have arisen 
within within the audience also thank you so much maya for your wonderful moderation and your own questions which were not only relevant but also very enlightening um, i would like to take a brief moment to uh, highlight the next week's session so you can join us next week at the same time so thursday at 1300 gmt you can use the same link that you use today the title of the session is Maurid, the HRMS for government entities in Oman. So again, we're, we're talking about Oman and one of, the, one of the wonderful initiatives they have in this country. Our speaker is Mr. Noman Mohammed al uh, from Oman, who is the IT advisor to the Ministry of Labor at the Ministry of Labor of, of the Sultanate of Oman. And our moderator next week will be Dr. Francesco Smaldone, who is a researcher in big data management from the University of Salerno, Italy. So I hope you can all attend. Uh, you are most welcome to pass this invitation on. And as previously mentioned, this video will be available on the ISC CAFRAD Seminar Series YouTube channel. Thank you so much for attending and have a lovely day.